And this was going to be a very well-attended rally. It was going to be a rally um, uh, to, to bring a bright, searing light to bear on the predicament of the documented in our community and the TPS uh, folks in our community and to call uh, on elected officials to effect change. Well, wouldn't you guess that ICE decided to choose this day to conduct a raid in Princeton in the morning before the rally. So faced with this, I think it's, it's going to be very important um, for all of us, particularly those of you um, who, who, who are citizens, who have the franchise, not only to uh, agitate for uh, the kinds of reforms that you know, at the federal level will regrettably, given the current political landscape, take many years to pass. But if and when necessary, to be willing to interpose yourselves, to interpose your bodies uh, when enforcement comes. Because this is something that we are all going to be called to do at some point in the next few years, I suspect. Good evening, welcome to Cambridge Forum in Harvard Square and thank you for joining us on this cold evening for a timely and hot topic, immigration and the DACA dilemma. The title of our discussion, The Dream Machine, The Journey from Undocumented to Deported, sprang from the title of our main speaker's autobiography, Undocumented. As we all know, immigration is a volatile subject which can ignite all sorts of passions and prejudices but the purpose of our forum here tonight is to inform and enlarge our understanding of the complex and multifaceted issue. I'm Mary Stack, the director of the forum, and tonight we're honored to have as our speaker a gifted Dominican native who arrived as a small boy in the United States, lived in a homeless shelter in New York, and now teaches at Princeton University, Professor Danelle Padilla Peralta. Before I introduce Professor Padilla Peralta and our esteemed panel, I would like to encourage you all to participate in the discussion after the presentation and also invite you to stay on for the book signing. So first, a brief history. Back in 2012, the Obama administration established DACA to grant people brought to the United States before age 16 a reprieve from deportation if they met certain strict guidelines. DACA applicants, and there were nearly one million undocu undocumented immigrants who came out of the shadows and applied, were assured that the personal information that they submitted would not be used to deport them. As a result, over 700,000 people were actively enrolled in DACA, and this gave them renewable work permits in two-year increments. Last September, however, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that DACA would expire on March the 5th, claiming Obama had violated the Constitution in setting it up. This despite Trump's hollow rhetoric that we love the Dreamers, we think the Dreamers are terrific, and that he wanted a bill of love. Tonight, to help us digest this bill of love and understand our own moral responsibility in standing with our communities, we have the eminent academician and immigration activist, Professor Daniel Padilla Peralta. He will tell his own story, but suffice to say that he graduated from Princeton, received his doctorates from Oxford, and his classics doctorate from Stanford. Welcome to Daniel. Good evening, everyone, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight to discuss immigration, to discuss the plight of the documented and of the undocumented. And I'd like to thank Cambridge Forum for hosting this conversation and Mary for bringing us all here. I want to spend the next few minutes laying out my own story with a view to underscoring some of the major moral quandaries that we find ourselves in at this moment. And what I'll be emphasizing are three interconnected developments. The first is my own life story and my move from undocumented status to status, and the degree to which this trajectory hinged in large part on luck. There is a dimension of this life story, as I'll mention uh, in a few minutes, uh, that carries uh, no small amount 
uh, of moral weight, not only and not even primarily uh, because it speaks to issues of indocumentation, but because the very fact that I am in front of you tonight and am in a position uh, to tell my story uh, and engage uh, with you all about it speaks to one of the fundamental problems with our immigration system and with our discourse about immigration. This segues to the second point that I'll make uh, over the course of my remarks, which is that one of the booms uh, of the past decade and a half has been the emergence of a movement of immigration activists, of dreamer activists, who have really centered the conversation in a new and productive and enriching way, who have sought to bring to light and to center as an object of political action and moral agency the plight of undocumented youth. But this has implicated uh, many of us, and I'll say that this has implicated me, uh, in a series of uncomfortable and quite honestly um, impossible to stomach decisions. As we will in all likelihood have occasion to discuss um, during our conversation later, one of the dimensions of the debate about uh, the documented and undocumented youth concerns a strategy of divide and conquer that was already operative under the Obama administration and that has become even more accentuated under this administration. And it is the idea that these youth, because they are high achieving, uh, can be siphoned off or separated from uh, their own families. And that the accomplishments of these youth uh, justify pursuing special forms of protection for them. Now that's not to say that I don't believe in the preservation of DACA. I believe that it is vital to preserve DACA. But the transactions involved in the preservation of DACA are ones that should give us pause. Fundamentally, what has been occurring over the past 10 or so years is that this group of activists who has been, that has been instrumental in reorienting the conversation has found itself time and time again, because of the polarization of the immigration discourse, between a rock and a hard place that forces them to choose between protections for themselves on the one hand and heightened enforcement that involves not infrequently uh, the singling out of their own relatives who do not qualify for DACA or related protections on the other. And this is an insidious moral quandary. It is one that I think has infected uh, the immigration discourse in ways small and large, and it is one that is implicated in something very corrosive, very deeply damaging about the nature of the immigration discourse unfolding today. But I want to start by talking about my story and by isolating one specific feature of that story um, to play up the third dimension of my uh, talk tonight. I arrived in the United States in 1989 as a four-year-old with my parents. My parents came to the United States seeking medical care for my mom, who was pregnant at the time with my younger brother. And when we traveled to the United States from the Dominican Republic, where I'd spent the first four years of my life, our expectation was that we would not be in the States all that long. And we secured temporary tourist visas uh, in order to travel. The expectation was that once my mom finished receiving prenatal care and gave birth successfully, that we would return to Santo Domingo. But this was not meant to be uh, because first, my mother became quite ill after giving birth uh, to my younger brother. And secondly, uh, because as she recovered, she and my father began having a series of conversations about whether they should stay. And there were a variety of reasons uh, behind uh, this conversation, uh, reasons that had to do uh, with the precarious state of their own lives in the Dominican Republic, and reasons that are outlined in the memoir that I would encourage you to buy. But in an effort to get a clearer sense of their options and in order to begin the process of adjusting status, my parents started asking around, started posing questions to anyone and everyone uh, in our community who might be in a position to help them and give them advice. And in due course, they were directed uh, to a friend of a friend of a friend who uh, promised to lend his expertise and help them file an application to adjust status. My parents didn't really know how this immigration system worked. Uh, they found it cryptic. They found it incredibly difficult to even get purchase on the essential parameters of status, of the different immigration statuses, uh, of the protocols and procedures entailed in adjusting status. 
And so they confided in a person who turned out to be a charlatan. He swindled them. He took their money and he left. And I would discover some years later that he had never filed anything. Uh, he had thoroughly and effectively conned them. This was my parents' exposure, initial exposure, uh, to uh, one of the many perverse incentive structures uh, of our current immigration system, as it was already evolving into its current state back in the early 1990s. In its essential form, this uh, perverse incentive system has to do uh, with the fact that the current immigration procedures for adjusting status, if one should be fortunate enough to even be able to adjust status, something that I'll uh, explain in a few minutes, are so dizzyingly opaque that it becomes quite easy for an entire secondary industry of con artists to emerge on the margins and take advantage of immigrant families. And not infrequently, these are con artists who are embedded in the very communities uh, to which immigrants, uh, nav uh, to which immigrants uh, uh, travel uh, and in which immigrants set up their homes. This con artist was a fellow Dominican American, just like my parents. My parents weren't deterred by this experience, at least initially, um, but they did decide uh, that they were going to stay in the United States and find some other way of resolving their status. Here's where they encountered uh, a predicament that uh, is familiar to many families. As a consequence of being swindled out of money, they didn't have anything in the way of resources uh, to put food on the table, let alone to pursue uh, the expensive adjustment uh, protocols that would need to be pursued for them to secure status for themselves and for me. And so, for the first few years of our time in the United States, uh, my parents took any and every job they could get in the hope of saving up money uh, to pursue an adjustment of status, and in the hope of attaining the kind of stability that would enable them to set roots more firmly down in the United States. But a few years into this, uh, my dad announced that he'd had enough. Uh, he had, was becoming increasingly frustrated by the fact that every few months uh, he had to uh, shuttle around from job to job because inevitably the question would be posed to him, do you have legal authorization to work? And he would have to say no. And so he hopped around from employment to employment until in 1993 he told my mom that he was headed back to the Dominican Republic and that if she wanted to, she could stay on by herself, or she could take uh, our, uh, my brother and me with her and join him back in Santo Domingo. My mom at that point did make the decision to stay, uh, but that decision uh, was not without consequences. Uh, she separated and then divorced from my dad. Uh, a few months later, after being unable to find uh, the kind of employment that would enable her to keep making rent payments, she and my brother and I were evicted uh, from our apartment in Queens, New York City, and ended up in the New York City shelter system. Now, throughout all this time, unbeknownst to me, there were developments in the political discourse underway, and these developments would have momentous consequences for the lives, not just of my family, but of many immigrant communities uh, throughout the country. The first major development, uh, which many of you uh, will be familiar with, um, was one that on its face would appear to be uh, a source of excitement and enthusiasm back in the 90s. And this was the election of a Democratic president uh, who uh, at the time uh, was trying to position himself as a centrist with some liberal leanings. But it turned out that this Democratic president, whom I should note, uh, proved to be very supportive of me much later on, uh, was prepared to embrace um, a substantial amplification uh, of the immigration qua deportation apparatus. And this was pretty ominous uh, in light um, of what would happen down the road. So in 1996, uh, a series of immigration reforms were passed that had direct and tangible relevance for families in my situation. Uh, one of these reforms uh, imposed a, a set of fairly draconian penalties on families who overstayed visas, and this, this was our family. Uh, we had uh, overstayed a tourist visa. As a consequence of these reforms, uh, and as a consequence of a tweak to those reforms uh, several years later uh, in the aftermath of an event um, that I will bring up in a moment, 
uh, it became almost impossible to conceive of ourselves um, as adjusting status um, in any meaningful way because in order to be eligible for an adjustment of status, my family would have to exit the United States and remain outside the United States for 10 years, which was the ban that was imposed on any families who had overstayed uh, the visa um, past 180 days as ours had done. So that was unfolding in the background uh, to our lives, even though I could only dimly perceive as uh, a preteen and then as a teen what was going on. More tangibly and more immediately in my life, um, there were these indications, uh, seemingly incidental at first um, and far more consequential later on, that pointed in the direction of a very turbulent adjustment uh, to uh, any sense of myself as a normal, standard, fair American. Among the first of these was the disquieting realization that struck my mom and me when I was translating for my mom, uh, that uh, much of what we were able to access in order to keep ourselves afloat during the period that we were in the shelter system and in the period after we transitioned out of the shelter system rode entirely on the fact that my younger brother was a US citizen. So we were able to draw and then benefit to a degree from uh, the social safety net uh, that existed in the 1990s um, and that has since been steadily and insistently chipped away, another development we can take up. Um, but we were only able to do so because my younger brother had US citizenship. And at the time, I counted myself fortunate to be in a position where we could get a rent subsidy that enabled us to cover the rent after we moved out of the shelter system, to receive public assistance um, for the food that we had to purchase. But later down the road, uh, this became one of those many moments where I was faced with an opportunity to re-examine what it meant to have the kind of hybrid split identity uh, that I came to see myself as owning and having. Because in the end, what I was being taught over the course of the mid and late 90s, what I was being conditioned to recognize as fundamental to my existence as an immigrant in this country, was that I had at best, at best, a second class citizenship. And that that citizenship um, was one that did not come with any of the emoluments of actual legal status. We did not have papeles at that time. It came only by virtue of the fact that we had in our family a U.S. citizen who was able to open some doors for us at some points in time. After we transitioned out of the shelter system, uh, I entered public school for fifth and sixth grades in central Harlem in New York. And as a consequence of the intervention of a mentor uh, who uh, entered my life uh, and my family's life while we were in the shelter system and who remained in close contact with us after, I was lucky to be admitted to a private school on Manhattan's Upper West Side where I attended from the seventh to the 12th grade. As the 1990s gave way to the early aughts, and as I made my way through high school, I began to discern in the news coverage uh, on my mom's favorite channels, Univision and Telemundo, that there was something afoot, and that something was very ominous. It was the amplification of the immigration apparatus and concomitantly, uh, the theatricalization of deportation as a tool uh, for rendering explicit the state's violence in immigrant communities. Now, I knew this kind of state-sanctioned uh, violence uh, in a different context. We had grown up, my brother and I and my mom, in neighborhoods um, that featured a very, hot, very heavy police presence, and I was accustomed to seeing police all over the place. But starting in the early aughts, uh, the idea that ICE could come around or that the predecessor of ICE could come around um, and round up families in my community um, took on more tangible form. And it really took on tangible form after an event that changed the lives of many in this country and beyond forever, an event that occurred in September of 2001, and that's 9-11. 
So 9-11 uh, had several consequences, uh, and um, obviously all of us in the room are familiar with the degree to which 9-11 uh, transformed our political and civic discourse, um, destroyed lives, uh, and uh, left a wound uh, that is still imperfectly healed. In the specific context of immigration, though, uh, it was 9-11 and the political transformation set in motion afterwards uh, that led uh, to the passage of the Patriot Act, and with the passage of the Patriot Act, a substantive restructuring of the immigration apparatus and of the deportation apparatus in particular. And it is from this 2001 moment uh, that we can see the emergence of a system for detaining incarcerating and deporting immigrants whose work at scale and in terms of order of magnitude represented a significant departure from anything that had preceded it. This would culminate in a substantial climb in deportations uh, under Obama's administration, and that's something uh, I'll have more to say about uh, in just a few minutes. But in the near term, it also meant that for me, as a person who by this point uh, was getting ready to finish high school and head off to college, the specter of the deportation apparatus took on an insistently menacing feel. It was in fact impossible not to be anxious about what it would mean uh, to encounter one of these officials. It was impossible not to think that at some point down the road, there would be someone sent from ICE or USCIS who would be in a position not only to isolate one's family, but in time to remove us from the country entirely. As all of this was humming along, I was applying to college. Uh, and thanks to the support of a co college guidance counselor at my private school, I was admitted uh, to Princeton, where I began as a student in 2002. As I was making my way to Princeton, there was another development uh, that um, seemed at first uh, to um, have something to offer me and other similarly situated folk one that held a great deal of promise for undocumented youth like me. And that was the introduction uh, of the DREAM Act, um, which was introduced in Congress for the first time in 2001 and was introduced every year thereafter um, into the early years of the Obama administration. And this act offered uh, a pathway to status for undocumented youth who met certain criteria, uh, who uh, had been enrolled in school, who showed that they had no criminal record, who fell within a certain age range. And as activism for the DREAM Act intensified and as a community of supporters of the DREAM Act uh, began to materialize, it became increasingly possible to envision the DREAM Act as having some hope of political success, or at a minimum, some hope of discursive viability. It was possible to construct a case around the merits of the dreamers, to place an accent on the nature of their contributions, to insist that in their educational achievements and their prospects for employment, and in everything that they had done to engage themselves civically, they represented the best of America. But what many of us weren't fully conversant with at the time, I think, or what many of us came very slowly to recognize some years down the road, was that in advocating for the DREAM Act, uh, something that I began to do in the late stages of my college career after I came out as an undocumented immigrant in 2006, we were being pitted against members of our own families, members of our families who did not qualify for the DREAM Act, members of our families who were no longer young, who did not meet the criteria, who did not fit conventional uh, metrics of success or attainment of achievement. And this introduced all kinds of moral ambiguities that did not lend themselves to ready simplification, let alone resolution. These were the kinds of moral ambiguities that forced quite a few of us to begin questioning whether the dreamer label made sense. And so on the one hand, beginning in 2006 and continuing every year after that, many of us really became more and more committed to the necessity of arguing for and justifying the nature of the undocumented young contribution to this country, while at the same time feeling that we were becoming beholden to a kind of transactional economy in which our achievements would be used to sideline, denigrate, isolate, detain, corral, and ultimately deport those who were not dreamers. 
Nowhere has this kind of explicit transactionality come more vividly to the fore than in the current administration's efforts to pit dreamers explicitly against those who would be targeted by enhanced enforcement. But before we get to that, I have to say something else about what preceded this administration's term. In 2006, I graduated Princeton, and with my graduation, I was forced to contend with the fact that now being out as an undocumented immigrant, my chances of securing employment uh, and um, building a life for myself in the United States were not particularly great. After weighing the options, I decided in 2000, late 2006 to depart the United States uh, while still being undocumented uh, and pursue my graduate studies in the United Kingdom thanks to a fellowship uh, that Princeton had provided me for study there. When I arrived at the United Kingdom, one of the first thoughts I had was how will I get back to the United States to see my mom? and to spend time with my family for the holidays. And initially, my feeling was that it wouldn't hurt to at least try to apply for a tourist visa, even though at that point I was under the 10-year bar. Having overstayed my visa as a kid, I was subject to the 10-year bar like anyone else, and leaving the United States meant that I had put myself willingly in a position to have to heed the tenure bar. But I thought when I got to the UK, uh, maybe, just maybe, there will be a way out. Maybe, just maybe, someone will be considerate of my application the day I submit it. Maybe I can line up some support uh, in the form of mentors and letter writers who might attest to my desire simply to travel to the United States from time to time. And you'll be unsurprised to learn uh, that on my initial application uh, to return to the United States, I was immediately and flatly rejected. I was rejected because, well, the 10-year bar is a very real thing. And there was no desire on the part uh, of the State Department or of the US Embassy in London to recommend me for what's called a waiver of inadmissibility. The only thing that made it possible for me to re-enter the United States and down the road to adjust status and to pursue a life that culminated with my getting a doctorate at Stanford and that has now had me teaching at Princeton after a stint teaching at Columbia, was that I was readmitted to the United States with a work visa and with that work visa the possibility of a waiver of inadmissibility, which is granted to me not once but twice. For this to have even been possible, required the efforts of lawyers who are incredibly sophisticated and adroit at navigating the system, and more than anything, it required capital. It required the support, the monetary support, of institutions that were willing to bat for me and were willing to see the various procedures through. It also required luck. And this now brings me to the last point I want to make before I cede the floor. Over the course of the past 10 years, there has been a dramatic uptick in the scale of deportation. This uptick really, really took uh, a ominous turn for the worse in the early stages of President Obama's administration. The idea behind uh, increased enforcement uh, in the early years of Obama's administration was that with a record of stringent enforcement to hand, President Obama could then turn to Republicans who were calling for increased enforcement and attempt to broker some kind of bipartisan deal that would feature relief for undocumented youth and at the same time some measure of increased uh, enforcement that would, be, uh, that would be authorized through greater funding allocations and that would also um, involve uh, the strengthening of USCIS through more hires. For some, this kind of deal represented 
a viable, effective compromise that would provide some guarantees to the undocumented, or at least a class of undocumented, and that at the same time would cater to the demands of some Republicans for greater enforcement. Well, guess what? People got deported, and there were Republicans who didn't want to play ball. So in the end, hundreds of thousands of people got deported from 2009 to 2012. Uh, ultimately, the Obama administration was responsible for the deportation of over two million people. And there was no legislative compromise. Faced with insistent activism on the part of Dreamers and their supporters, President Obama in 2012 did finally, via executive memorandum, implement DACA. And DACA is now what is under siege and under assault. But it should be borne in mind that DACA is, at best, a patchwork solution to a problem that affects 11 million people, and that those of us who are committed to the protection of undocumented youth also have to be committed to the protection of all of the undocumented. And that furthermore, we are in a position where the call to become responsible and engaged citizens will, I think, entail a revolutionary politics when it comes to immigration rights. In the end, the game that has been played for over 15 years is a game that attempts to isolate certain categories of immigrants as deserving and certain categories of immigrants as undeserving. There are many, I'm sure, here who will find that on some visceral level this makes sense. But I'm sure that there are quite a few of you here who feel that on a visceral level, this kind of selectioning, this kind of categorization and taxonomy is ethically problematic, if not repulsive. And it is with that in mind that I turn to the last comment I'll make, um, and then um, we can have a conversation. Earlier I mentioned that the opacity of the immigration apparatus uh, m creates situations where some members of uh, the community can profit uh, off uh, the asymmetries of information that exist in the context of immigration. In the context of contemporary immigration reform, uh, the true story that uh, I think calls all of us to be attentive and the one that I think will be showcased in our conversation, is how, if at all, local, municipal, and state actors will rise to the challenges of the contemporary moment. And this is all the more important in light of the broad trajectory of federal policy that I've underlined and that I've sketched very impressionistically. And we are fortunate uh, to be uh, in a town and in a state um, that has sought uh, to protect undocumented folk and to take what steps it can to ensure that uh, these folk um, are as sheltered from the violence of enforcement as possible. But, and this is the big but, at multiple junctures in the next few years, the prospect of some kind of grand bargain will be dangled before those of you who are in a position to exercise the franchise. And when that prospect is dangled before you, the question that you will have to ask is whether it makes sense to you as a matter of ethics to prioritize the well-being of some undocumented folk over the well-being of others. And that question is exactly the question uh, that we have to contend with in this contemporary moment, not least because the federal policies in place and the thrusts of federal policies about to materialize are going to insistently force this kind of choice on the part of the electorate over and over again. And so it is with a heavy heart about contemporary developments, but with the hope of optimism, uh, the hope and optimism uh, that local and municipal and state initiatives will provide some kind of counterweight to the perniciousness of federal policy that I cede the floor. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to our conversation. Sitting next to Danelle is Irene Friedel, and she's an attorney with 25 years of experience who gave up a very successful law practice to work pro bono for the PEAR project. 
She uh, specializes in providing representation to immigrants in detention. So, welcome, Irene. Thank you. <clears throat> Sitting next to Irene, we actually have two individuals, both from the city of Cambridge. Manny Lusardi is the newly appointed immigration liaison to the mayor of Cambridge, Mark McGovern. And this very week, uh, Mark McGovern set up the Cambridge Legal Defense Fund in conjunction with our fourth guest, Geeta Pradhan. She's the president of the Cambridge Community Foundation. So I'd like to welcome you all. Um, thank you for making the time to be here. Um, first of all, um, Manny, let's start with you. Um, why should we care about this uh, DACA decision and why have you become so involved with it yourself? Sure, thank you. First of all, Mayor McGovern and I uh, would like to thank the Cambridge Forum for inviting us uh, to show and, and present what the city of Cambridge, is, uh, the mayor's office is working on to help protect vulnerable immigrants. DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is important to me because it, it hit home, uh, not only DACA, but uh, the, the war on immigrants in general, uh, especially the TPS recipients or temporary protected status. I'm a first generation American, and my father came to this country during the First World War. And if you're trying to do the math, uh, my father was nearly 60 years old when I was born. Um, during when I was growing up, my father would tell me constantly about the stories of the xenophobia, hate, and bigotry that he dealt with in the 1920s and 30s. And if you take the uh, countries and the, uh, change the countries' names and the faiths they belong, the same language that was used 100 years ago is being used today. It's very different. And granted, it is at a hyper level currently, but there is no difference. And the reason for that is it's pretty simple. I'm a simple guy. I, I tend to look at things pretty simply. Um, but it's pretty much because they are generally poor. Immigrants who come here are generally poor, and they can't vote, meaning they have no power. So the uh, city, the mayor's office, and myself, um, Mark McGovern, uh, we, about a year or two ago, we started talking about how we can change uh, certain local policy, or what, what I call making immigration local. A lot of people, especially legislators, concentrate on the federal uh, immigration laws and say that there's not much we can do. I so disagree with that. The Legal Defense Fund that was um, started this past Monday with, in collaboration with the Cambridge Foundation is an example of that. I could have started uh, a, a nonprofit, 5014C or, or whatever, and raised the money to create my own Legal Defense Fund. But it's important that we show immigrants, cities, all cities, that they can trust us that they can come to us and tell us about any crimes that are being committed against them, especially women. There, there, uh, there are women in this very city that are just a few blocks of here, from here that are in protection because they were being trafficked. Um, that is not um, foreign to Cambridge. So working with trusted uh, collaborators like the Cambridge Foundation is important. But to me, DACA, it just represents uh, the kids that are just looking, or the young people that are looking just for opportunity, just like I did. Growing up in a, a very poor immigrant family, I had to start working at a very early age. And my father was telling me those stories, and I wanted to support my family. So I, again, I started working. And I would go to high school and middle school maybe one day a month. I ended up graduating high school illiterate. I couldn't read or write. I remember looking at the superintendent who handed me my diploma, and I looked at him on stage and said, I can't read this. A teacher who was retiring the same year I graduated helped me that summer to learn how to read or write so I can go to college that, that fall with the other kids and graduated eventually with a 396 grade point average. And yes, I'm very proud of that. But it was just the same thing that's happening now. These kids just want opportunities. The same with, with the, the people that are here under temporary protected status or any other immigrant situation, just like our parents did. Thank you. Um, Geeta, why did you get involved with this? Why did the Cambridge Foundation support this? So first of all, um, thank you, Mary, for inviting us to be a part of this. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for your story. I would say that I think for every one of us, every, I, I would say anyone who's not Native American is an immigrant in this country. And I think for every one of us, this touched us in some very, very personal way. 
I think as you were telling your story, I was thinking about my own story, which was coming to the United States as a spouse of an F1 visa holder. My husband was here uh, to do his graduate studies, and I decided to go to school, and I um, got my own visa. I decided I, I had one year to work. I started working. I fell in love with inner city America, and I have devoted 25 years of my life to that work. And over time, that enabled me to get more permanent status in this country. And so it is about the issue of opportunity, and it is about the issue of choice. And I have to say that in my, when I look back at my life, I didn't come here to stay here. I ended up staying here. And I remember having a conversation with my children when my older son was 13 and my younger son was seven to say, we are going back to India. And my kids said, what do you mean going back to India? This is home. And when I look at DACA recipients, you know, the, 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 um, that's exactly what it is for them. This is the only home they have ever known. This was the only home my children ever knew. In India, they were foreigners. They, they, they did not fit in. They did not, they weren't comfortable with the language the culture, the in environment, everything for them was home. And we decided to stay. And I think many families make those decisions, you know, because of the future of their children or because uh, of where they are. So that was from a very personal level. I think this uh, issue has touched me uh, because I feel that all of us came here as immigrants. In fact, the ancestors of some of us who came here very early actually were undocumented illegal immigrants. They did not have rights in this country. They made rights for themselves. They made, they created conditions and made themselves legal. So I think it is, it's, it, there's, a, uh, there's an issue of justice for me in, from, so that's, then when it comes to the Cambridge Community Foundation and why we chose to partner with the mayor's office for the uh, Cambridge Legal Defense Fund, which by the way, there are some um, little handouts at the back Get those, pass those around, because I think it is really important for all of us to make a statement to show our support for this issue. Uh, the reason the foundation got involved with this is we were created 100 years ago to look out for the well-being of the city and to sort of give voice to the values that the city was about, which were issues of, uh, and all of you as Canterburyans know that, issues of inclusion, of diversity, of compassion, of being a welcoming community are fundamental to Cambridge. It's a place that, you know, of, of ideas, and, and, and that's what ideas, you know, those things that foster those kinds of ideas. We were also, um, uh, you know, we, uh, we are also an organization that is created to support issues of social equity, um, justice, fairness, and shared prosperity. And uh, we are the, a platform for local giving. So it was just, it was a very natural that we would do this. Uh, we launched this fund, and uh, the rationale for this fund is that. Um, uh, and I'm going to read some statistics that one of the speakers at the, um, Leslie Dutrani, who's a, a lawyer, actually shared with people about the impact of legal help when someone who is, um, uh, uh, you know, um, either detained or not detained goes before uh, immigration court and what that likelihood is of. Um, so represented immigrants who were in detention who had a custody hearing were four times more likely to be released from detention um, if they had legal representation. Detained immigrants with legal representation were 11 times more likely to seek relief as, uh, as asylum than those without legal representation. Um, among detained immigrants, those with rep representation were twice as likely as unrepresented immigrants to obtain immigration relief if they sought it. And for those who were never detained, they were five times more likely to seek relief if they had an attorney. And represented immigrants who were never detained were five times more likely than their under represented counterparts to obtain relief. So there's enough evidence that shows that when people go with representation, they have a much greater likelihood of getting relief. 
The Legal Defense Fund is therefore created to provide that kind of um, uh, uh, support. Um, and I think, you know, the other point you made, Daniel, which I think is really interesting, is that, you know, uh, if you have a criminal um, offense, you get legal defense. If you have a civil, you know, you not even, a, I mean, you, you overstayed your welcome by a little bit. You don't have any representation at all. So I think it's really important for us to make sure that we are providing this kind of support. The support will be provided through legal assistance, nonprofits, um, a very open, very transparent process. Um, and um, our, you know, and I, I want to sort of underscore the fact that you know, uh, March 5th has come and gone. We have another five months of relief. God knows what will happen then or after that. Time is of the essence. We need to act on this and act on this now. That segues quite well to Irene. Um, why would somebody leave a very cushy, comfortable law practice to take on what must be quite depressing on a daily basis, um, watching families being split? And how effective can you be in, in putting that kind of action off? Right. So I sat in my nice corner office for many years thinking about all the things I'd like to do. Um, outside of my law practice, my corporate law practice, and the last presidential election was the last straw. And I decided to get off my hands and get out of my corner office. I now have a lovely little cubicle, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> <laughs> but let me talk a little bit about what I've been doing with the group that I'm working with, because it, 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 it is a nice compliment to everything that we've heard so far tonight. I'm working with a group called the Pair Project, which represents immigrants uh, in detention, as well as uh, asylum seekers who seek asylum affirmatively. I never thought I would do this kind of work. I heard it described to me, and I thought, I could never do that. Um, we go into immigration court and represent detainees on a very short timetable. They have hearings that are like mini trials, and we represent them uh, to obtain immigration relief. So I spend now every day practically in local jails where immigrant uh, ICE detainees are held. I just came from the Suffolk County House of Correction before coming here to see one of my clients. It is very depressing. It's also very uplifting. The work is just, it's an emotional roller coaster, I have to say. We look at people as individuals. So we've been hearing tonight about categories uh, of people, DACA recipients and undocumented and this and that. We, as lawyers, focus on each individual what are their legal circumstances? What are, what's their factual background? When we go, the Pair Project is the one nonprofit in Massachusetts that, that's authorized to go into ICE detention centers to do intakes and screenings. So we go into the various jails and we meet with people and in a short period of time, we hear a lot of narratives and stories and we have to decide which immigrants or which detainees we can help. And unfortunately, because there is a very, very limited funding for lawyers, the pair project is very small. There's you know, only a few people, unfortunately, that we can help at a time. And that is one of the most difficult, difficult situations. And I work with a lot of young lawyers, and it is so distressing to say to people, we can't help you. To say to somebody who's in jail, who's separated from their family, um, to say, we can't help you. And then you go back and you see them time and again. They're still there. They're still desperate. But there is very limited. Um, there are very limited resources for lawyers, although lawyers make all the difference, from what I can tell, for detainees. So I absolutely congratulate the City of Cambridge and the Cambridge Foundation for setting up the Legal Defense Fund. If you want to do something that's helpful, if you're tired of feeling like Congress is not going to do anything, President Trump isn't going to do anything, please give money to <laughs> the, the Defense Fund, to the Pair Project, to legal organizations, because from what I can tell, lawyers are the best hope for individuals that are currently in detention. To segue to DACA, um, what we expect to happen, and unfortunately it's going to be happening imminently, is to see DACA recipients showing up in detention because they are losing their legal protections. It is already happening because Congress and President Trump have not enacted a bill. DACA um, recipients, some of them have already given up their status. They are, many of them are afraid, and I hate to be categorical, so this is all anecdotal, but some of them are afraid to renew their status, even though courts have allowed them to continue to, or forced the government to allow them to continue to do that. Many people are afraid of ICE with good reason. They don't want to call the government and give their current contact information because 
that is uh, a recipe for disaster for them personally. So some people are not renewing. Um, they're losing their work authorizations. They're, I've heard anecdotally that some people are thinking about going back to the country they came from where they have no contacts, they have no family, they have nothing there. So we, what we expect to see in detention soon are former DACA holders and TPS, um, which Manny mentioned, temporary protective status is also having a huge impact on people who came from countries like Haiti and um, Nicaragua and other, many other places. They came here temporarily. They were given protection for a period of time and President Trump has taken that protection away. And so we will see many TPS holders, El Salvador, is a big one. We're gonna see those people in detention. And yes, they have families, they have children here, but uh, unless they have some real form of immigration relief, which unfortunately is not at all a guarantee, many, many people are going to be deported, have already been deported to countries where they have absolutely no contacts and no families while their children are growing up here. So it's very difficult, it is depressing. However, I don't wanna leave you on, a, on that note. I want, to, um, not, I want you all to be inspired to give money to lawyers, but <laughs> let me tell you that there are success stories. So I have, I have also, in this work, I've been so depressed at times, but I've also been incredibly uplifted. We have a bell at the PEAR project that gets rung when there's a successful outcome on a case, and I'm happy to say that PEAR has a very good tr track record of success, and I have heard the bell uh, be rung. I have rung it myself. When we meet individuals, we do meet people that have really strong asylum cases and, and other forms of relief, and the lawyers at the group, and there are many pro bono lawyers throughout Boston um, and in Cambridge and other parts of this, this area that are working hard for immigrants and are succeeding. So we've had successes. It's not, not every story is a, a dismal one. And I could go on and on and on with endless anecdotes of what I've experienced since I've started doing this work, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Before we open this up to the floor, which I'd like people to come up and feel free to start addressing the panel with their questions, um, I wanted to ask you about the national view of this. How is this gonna play out with sanctuary cities and, for example, the state of California um, in terms of funding cuts now, stopping these governments from enacting their own views, their own democratic views about employing these things. Is there, Anna, can you address that? Perhaps? Well, locally, uh, here in Cambridge, it's Manuel Lissardi from Liaison of Immigrant Affairs and the uh, Mayor's Office of Cambridge. Uh, there's been threats to erase, uh, arrest uh, local elected officials and people like me. I welcome it. Um, I hope they come and get me because that'll bring attention to the issue and it'll put somebody like me on the front page, I would be thrilled to be arrested. But uh, locally, there have been threats, but what, thankfully, Cambridge is a wealthy city. Our city manager, Louis de Pasquale, and the mayor, Mark McGovern, have determined that if funds were pulled, uh, even though he, Trump has to go, Mr. Trump has to go through Congress to do that, it would be about approximately $12 million, and we are very fortunate we can afford to replace that. That, that has been looked into, so it would not affect uh, so much. It wouldn't be a fun thing, but it would not affect uh, Cambridge that much. Uh, and most of the um, federal funding that would be pulled goes to the police department. So he, it it's, would be basically illegal, but as we all know, that's, that's something that doesn't stop Mr. Trump. Um, but in cities like New Bedford, uh, Lowell, where they are poor communities, uh, it would be, those cuts would be very drastic. But uh, we welc I would welcome any personal attacks from Mr. Trump. What you've just heard is uh, the kind of official of which we need many more, um, because the reckoning that, that has already been taking place that will transpire in the near term uh, is not uh, one uh, that uh, will, at first blush, give us much reason for optimism. The administration has been very clear that it will target communities uh, that attempt to enact some measure of sanctuary protection. And if you look at some of the materials that have been put out by ICE over uh, the past several months, the language becomes ever more strident um, about this. So in their end of year report, um, ICE, after enumerating the statistics of uh, non-criminal immigrant arrests and at-large administrative arrests, uh, ICE bragged, quote, 
the total number of at-large arrests increased after the executive order um, from early last year was issued, particularly in those areas that do not honor ICE detainers or limit or restrict ICE's access to their jail population, end quote. Uh, the, the theatrics of ICE enforcement um, in, in this context entail not only sort of singling out communities that uh, have elected leaders and, and have folks working um, in uh, high-level municipal capacities, um, such as Manny. Um, these theatrics also involve efforts at disrupting collective action uh, that is centered on giving voice to the undocumented uh, and uh, to the immigrant. So I'll cite one example for this. There is an organization in central Jer New Jersey, uh, where I live, uh, LALDEF, uh, the Latin American Legal uh, Defense and Education Fund, uh, that has done a lot of advocacy work and a lot of support work for undocumented folk. In December, uh, they uh, chose uh, a day uh, for, uh, and a, a time uh, to hold a rally uh, in downtown Princeton. And this was going to be a very well-attended rally. It was going to be a rally um, uh, to, to bring a bright, searing light to bear on the predicament of the documented in our community and the TPS uh, folks in our community and to call uh, on elected officials to effect change. Well, wouldn't you guess that ICE decided to choose this day to conduct a raid in Princeton in the morning before the rally? So, Faced with this, I think it's, it's going to be very important um, for all of us, particularly those of you um, who, who, who are citizens, who have the franchise, not only to uh, agitate for uh, the kinds of reforms that, you know, at the federal level will regrettably, given the current political landscape, take many years to pass, but if and when necessary, to be willing to interpose yourselves, to interpose your bodies. Uh, when enforcement comes, because this is something that we're all going to be called to do at some point in the next few years, I suspect. Well, I would welcome anyone who wants to pose any questions. I don't know if we have any undocumented um, people here. I know that we had Harvard uh, had exactly what we were speaking to earlier. Uh, 17 professors were voluntarily arrested as part of the DACA demonstration. And they noted that there are several thousand um, students in this area who are undocumented, which I think surprised a lot of people to learn that. It's not what you expect to hear. Hi, thank you all for being here. It's been very interesting. I have a, one question about the Legal Defense Fund. Is who will be able to access this money and how, what is the process for that? Yeah. So the, 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 right now we're in the fundraising stage, but we've actually made a commitment that by uh, mid, a little after mid, by mid-May or so, we will put out a request for proposals um, that qualified nonprofit legal assistance corporations or com uh, organizations can apply for. Um, the money will not go to individuals because we have to make sure that we are one, ensuring that the highest quality representation is being provided, uh, and second, that, uh, you know, that there isn't any misuse of funds, so it won't go to any individual, uh, even though um, no doubt in my mind there are wonderful individual lawyers and law firms that do this. Uh, by, as a community foundation, by mandate, we can only fund nonprofits, so the money will go through nonprofits to provide, to support legal assistance and it could go into for any number of reasons. It could be to hire lawyers um, for, uh, say, someone like Pear who might want to hire a lawyer, or say, someone like um, a Community Legal and Counseling Center a Classic, um, which uses volunteer lawyers. We may be able to help them to build some infrastructure so that they can bring on board more volunteer lawyers. So the idea is to increase the legal representation for. Uh, people who are at fear of deportation. Um, it will be an open process and we will report uh, out to the community on what uh, has been accomplished through this. Okay. And that's oh. not just for Cambridge, right? It's for... It is for people who, I mean, it's essentially, it's the Cambridge Legal Defense Fund, so we are being, you know, we recognize that 
Cambridge has become such an expensive city that a lot of people who uh, would live, used to live here can't live here anymore. They probably, so it's people who live and work in Cambridge essentially, but I don't, you know, this is a, an issue that you need to be more generous and more humanitarian about. And so we're gonna have to maybe prioritize local, but uh, not keep it exclusively for local. I'd just like to add that, um, uh, what Takeda had said, that is that the Boston has also done a similar initiative called the Greater Boston Legal Defense Fund. So that we're, uh, it's gonna be around the same idea. It's not, there, are no, there are more undocumented immigrants that work in Cambridge than live in Cambridge, as you can imagine. And as uh, Professor Peralta said, that there is a lot of fraud uh, in this industry, and, and locally they're called notarios. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to keep away from giving money to anybody who asks, and through Gita's uh, generous uh, contributions, we're going to you know farm it out or bid out finding the, the appropriate organizations. And hopefully anyone who is in need of help will get it between Cambridge and Boston. And also, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm here is we're hoping to motivate other communities in, uh, around the state to do similar funds and also treat immigration as something that we can do locally, not just federal. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to tell a, just a small story. This morning I was in immigration court as part of an accompaniment program. Yeah. Um, and a long story short, I was horrified to see this detainee brought in in his orange ice jumpsuit, shackled his arms to his waist to his, his ankles like this, yep. going, in, going into the courtroom. And I just didn't understand why that was the case except simply to humiliate this person because where was he going? It was just horrifying and shocking to see that. Fortunately, all ICE detainees are brought into court shackled and chained, women and men. It's a policy of the federal government, and it's been challenged, but not successfully. And the reason why the, uh, the defense fund is also really important, immigration law, a lot of people don't understand, is civil law. It's like if you got a parking ticket, if you were brought in to answer for your parking ticket and change, uh, chains, that's not right. Um, so the way we're doing things currently, federally, it's un-American. It, it, to not offer people representation uh, for something that can be as more drastic than a criminal offense. Uh, some people that are sent back to El Salvador will die if they go back. There are gangs that have, under, have threatened families that if you come back, we will kill you. Do I correctly understand that under the current administration and under current law, the prospects for the DACA beneficiaries is very grim? Maybe, I, and assuming that's more or less correct, then the only hope would be for um, a democratic majority to emerge from the next election controlling both houses of Congress. And that mm -hmm. won't happen until after the current DACA extension has expired. Is, that, is all of that correct? More or less. Um, of course, during President Obama's time, the DREAM Act and immigration reform was not enacted, so hopefully Democrats will do it differently this time. The DACA is also being litigated in the courts, and two different courts in California and New York have issued injunctions to stop DACA, so there will be litigation. Um, hopefully that the, the injunctions will become permanent short of uh, something happening in Congress, but yes, voting is extremely important and getting in uh, electing people that support immigration reform is hugely important. Thank you. I just want to preface my remarks by saying I think the panel and everyone who's here tonight is the reason we're all gravitating to a Cambridge area to live. Um, but I guess my question is really, there, you say there are some cases that people are granted some sort of status. What makes the difference between those that are accepted and those that aren't? And, and is there any way to prepare people for that uh, court appearance or whatever? Yes, that's a, it's a very good question. It's, it's not a question with an easy answer, but we do have laws in this country that provide relief to certain people that have meet certain requirements. For example, asylum uh, protects people who can establish that they suffered persecution, 
past persecution in their country or have a reasonable fear of future persecution in their home country that is um, acquiesced to by the government, that's asylum. There are, there's the Convention Against Torture that protects people who can establish that they are more likely than not to suffer torture in their home country. There are laws that protect victims of domestic violence, uh, people that have, are the victims of a crime in the U.S. that cooperate with the investigation of that crime may qualify for relief. So the immigration laws are extremely complicated. It gets to the fraud point that there are people out there promising to help um, to provide legal advice. They take the money and they don't do that. It's very important for immigration lawyers or for people to consult knowledgeable immigration lawyers because the laws are very complicated. There are opportunities for relief, though. So um, one of the, the big points for people that have TPS that is expiring and DACA that's expiring is they need to consult with lawyers to figure out what other options, what other relief might be available for them. A lot of the laws have deadlines for, for example, asylum has a one-year deadline. There are exceptions, and there are also bars to certain laws based on criminal activity. So. Um, it's very, very fact-specific, and so we have to look at every individual, understand their background, understand what they're faced with to do a proper evaluation. Do you get to spend much time with each person to get some of this background information, or how does well, that when, when we do work? intakes, it's, a very, it's fairly brief, except we're, we're trying to flag people that we need to go back and spend more time with. Once we have a client, we spend a lot of time with that person. So I, I've gotten to know my clients extremely extremely well in short periods of time, and they're, they're under a lot of stress, the clients that are in detention, they're sitting in jail, and it's extremely, as you can imagine, extremely stressful for them, not knowing if they're gonna be sent back to a place they fled because they thought they were gonna be killed. So it's, a, it's extremely difficult. It's a pressure cooker in these detention facilities for all the people there combined. Okay, thank you. And for your work. Just to jump in very quickly, um, for anyone who, who would like a, 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 a meditation, a distillation of um, what it means to conduct this kind of fact-finding uh, and, and what it means to prepare those who are applying uh, for uh, relief, um, Valeria Luiselli's Tell Me How It Ends, uh, which is a, a short but sweet uh, or not so sweet um, book and that's available at the co-op um, uh, would um, be illuminating. Um, it's a a very searing account um, on the part of a translator uh, who has, for the past several years, worked with children uh, who are mm -hmm. entering the United States. Um, and she lays out um, it, with an economy and, 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 a, and a precision uh, what is involved in helping children and families uh, present their story in a way that might get them the chance of relief. Um, and what happens when the stories are not assembled the right way. Could you just tell us the title of that book and her name again? Valeria Luiselli, Tell Me How It Ends. Mm. I'd like to add that um, a lot of people know about DACA and TPS, Temporary Protected Status, but does anybody here about know about the CAM program, C-A-M? That was ended last year by uh, President Trump. What that is is uh, protections for uh, minors coming from traveling alone from Central America. The trafficking, in, as I said earlier, here even in Cambridge has increased substantially just because of that. Now there's no, there, that was started, I believe, by President Obama mm -hmm. and ended just last year by, by uh, Mr. Trump. But it's programs like that that are not making the news. Uh, chief Beck, who's the uh, LA County uh, police chief last year reported a 25% decrease in uh, reported sexual assaults by Latino women in LA. A lot of people would think, wow, that's wonderful. But what it is, is because women, as proven by those statistics, are afraid to come forward and report sexual assaults. It's as simple as that. Currently, there is legislation going through the Massachusetts State, uh, State House called the Safe Communities Act. Uh, Mayor McGovern and I both uh, testified during those hearings. The room was packed with hundreds and hundreds of people, a lot of them immigrants and undocumented immigrants, telling their stories. But that legislation, even in here in blue Massachusetts, is stalled in the state house. Yeah. It has not passed yet. 
call your legislators and let them know that this is important legislation that would, in essence, uh, in a layman's terms, make Massachusetts uh, a sanctuary state. Could you uh, just give us a little bit of a profile of some of these folks that you meet with in uh, prison in terms of what the circumstances were that um, caused them to get detained? Yeah, I can, in generalities, yes, um, obviously to protect confidentiality, but while many people are coming into detention because they are going into court to defend a criminal case, and they are picked up by ICE as they're going into court. So they are, they are actively going to meet their ob legal obligations and are picked up by ICE on the way in. Then, uh, since they cannot properly defend themselves in their criminal action, th they could have a difficult or a negative outcome in the criminal case, which could then bar their ability to stay and get immigration relief, so that's a, that's a very difficult situation. Um, we have people that are picked up. I, I've seen people in immigration court who are picked up shopping at Home Depot. I mean, I hate to say it, because I don't want to, well, this is obviously a <laughs> depressing, difficult conversation, so I won't hold back on my stories, but I saw in immigration court uh, a couple who had children at home, and they were both picked up, both parents were picked up at Home Depot because they'd been followed by ICE, because at some point in the past, the mother, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, had some small infraction that had never been resolved on her record. Both parents were picked up. All of their children were still at home. I've seen people, uh, a woman, we came across a woman in detention who was still nursing her baby. The baby was put in foster care and the mother was put in detention because she's undocumented. I don't know what the trigger was for her to be picked up, but these days ICE is going out and just picking up people wherever they can. They're knocking on doors of apartment buildings in known immigrant communities and just sweeping through and picking up whoever is undocumented. We've had a, you know, people that are homeless or undocumented get picked up. One of the most important things, or one very important thing, is educating the immigrant communities over how to deal with ICE and how to protect their rights. And one thing that the PEAR Project has done with, in coordination with many other nonprofits is to do what's called KYR presentations, know your rights presentations. These are hugely, hugely important. I thought about bringing my copy of the Constitution to this <laughs> meeting, thinking of Kazir Khan, because a lot of people are surprised to learn that they, are, even though they are here undocumented, they have constitutional rights. They have the right to remain silent. They have the right not to open their door to ICE if, they don't, if ICE does not have a warrant. They have the right, if, if there's a raid at the workplace, not to reveal any information about themselves. If they are stopped at a traffic stop, they have the right not to give fingerprints. They have the, they have, they have to under, people have to understand that they do have some protections. People feel helpless and vulnerable, under, which is very understandable. But getting the word out um, that there are some rights, and we will go out and do these presentations anywhere. We've been going into mosques and churches and high schools. We've been doing the presentations to service providers, um, anywhere, anyone who will listen to us, we will do these presentations to get the word out um, how, on how people can protect themselves. That I know that was not an answer to the question of the profile, but in terms of the profile, we're seeing people from all walks of life. We've had people who are live in the suburbs, have a nice house, they've been in the country for 20 years, have a successful business, they get picked up because of some little thing in their background. We have people that are, you, know, you see people that are, have a lot of criminal problems, they've been drug traffickers, um, young people, old people. We have the, I have a client right now who's a, a teenager who fled his country because of political persecution. He was actively involved in anti-government activities, came to the US. We see people that are fleeing their countries because of sexual orientation persecution. Um, they arrive at the border at Logan Airport and say, I'm seeking asylum, and they come right in. Uh, and they have, I, I've heard story after story that has just amazed me. One of the things I've had to learn to do since I left my cushy law job is not to gasp in horror <laughs> at every story I hear, um, because I, it's, the variety is amazing. I'm also representing children who come in unaccompanied at the border, who are not in detention. The one thing I, this is, absolutely not an answer to the question, but there's a lot of discussion about building a wall, building a barrier to keep people from coming in. And what I have seen 
is that people are going to come to this country to save their lives, no matter what kind of barrier is built, no matter what kind of wall is built. If you're fleeing for your life, if you're a child or an adult and you believe the only way you can save your life is to get to this country, you're gonna get into this country. People are, I've, I've been really impressed by the ingenuity <laughs> of people getting in here, but if you ask, I, I've often asked clients, well, what have you heard about Trump and you, you managed to get here even though we have this current president with these policies and they just look at me blankly. They don't, they don't care about Trump, they don't know about Trump. What they know is that if they didn't get themselves out of their home, like that day they were gonna be killed and they had to save themselves. And so they're still, you know, America is still viewed as the place that you can come to and be protected. In some ways that is uplifting because it, some people do get protection still. It's not, it's not that no one is getting, it's not that everybody is getting denied. We are seeing, you know, the, the laws are still being applied. There are still fair judges and um, some people are able to get through the system with effective legal assistance. But that was a long-winded answer to it. Briefly, uh, I can, uh, uh, before I give a, a situation, uh, Irene mentioned, my name is Manny Lasardi again, the, the advocates in, in, um, uh, who are working immigrants, is a thing called uh, a red card. Uh, you can get them online from the ACLU or many immigrant advocacy groups, they're free. Uh, what it is is know your rights information. They're laminated, so uh, immigrant, an undocumented immigrant can put them, throw them at an ICE agent into a mail slot and hit them in the eye if they so choose. Uh, but it has basic and know your rights. ICE tricks immigrants. They'll have menus on them that uh, and say, I have a warrant, open the door. They'll scream, they'll intimidate. I know I would be throwing a door open and tell them, take me away, I'm easily intimidated. Um, but these are, are available. Uh, recently, as someone in the audience can attest to, I dealt with a young woman with two small children who was beaten savagely by her boyfriend on a every other day basis. I knew her through church, and she approached me and said, Manny, I, I need help. Um, I, she was, had the letter to order for deportation. She uh, could not appeal any further. His, he was an American citizen. The children are American citizens. His threat was, if you go to the police, I, you will be deported. And sadly, I could not disagree with an abuser. So the interesting part of this story was why I have two daughters and it was very difficult and very emotional a uh, few weeks for me to deal with. The Mexican government actually helped her. They have a program where a SIAM, don't ask me the acronym, but it's CIAM. I'd be happy to give you the phone number if, you, if anybody would like it. I called them. They have a 24-7 hotline that helps uh, Mexican uh, nationals, even if they're living here in the United States, and they got her to safety, and I think that's a shame. Just a quick question. I'm curious as to how long the detainees, what is the average length of time that they are detained before decisions are made? They're either thrown out or they're put back with their families. And, uh, and does it vary state to state or, or, you know, is one state longer, is one state shorter? I'm just curious as to how, what the average time was. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's apropos of a case I was working on today, which is <laughs> I was working on a habeas corpus petition to get somebody out of detention who had been there more than six months. So six, it's a federal issue, it's federal law um, that applies to detainees. There's a, a general standard that six months should be the maximum that somebody should be held unless it is reasonably foreseeable that they will be deported to their country of origin. So. Uh, Judges really vary in terms of how quickly they can process a case. There are some judges that will try to get somebody through in maybe a month or a few weeks. I mean, unfortunately, for a lawyer who's trying to prepare a case properly, it takes, it takes some time to get all the documents. We have cases in detention, I'm working on them all the time, where we're trying to get doctors to go in and do um, examinations of people in detention behind, you know, it, we have to get them into the into the jails. We have to get them approved. We have to get them cleared. That takes time for the doctors to go in, to find the doctor, get them to go in, write the report. We also try to get country conditions experts lined up, and they might be from a university, from Harvard, from somewhere across the country, somewhere in the UK. You want to get you want to get the expert lined up. So if, to prepare your case as well as possible, you need a little bit of time. On the other hand, your client's in detention. They want to get out. The judge wants them out. So. Um, about two months is 
probably, I don't want to, I don't have the statistic, but from our perspective, we'd like about two months from beginning to end to prepare the case. However, if somebody's in for six months or longer, um, at that point they may seek, they may file a habeas corpus petition with the federal court if the government is not able to get travel documents to send them back to their country, which does happen. There are certain countries like Vietnam, if you came to the U.S. before a certain date, Vietnam is not accepting citizens for repatriation. Cuba is a difficult, uh, it's difficult for the U.S. to send people back to Cuba. So actually there are people from certain countries that will, uh, even though they've had an order of removal or deportation signed by a judge, they will act not actually be deported. Because their country, they, they're, you know, people, some people are stateless, they don't have a country to go back to. Oh, and if they're you. stuck in detention, then they can file the habeas petition to get out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I thank you for being here today because this is very, very nice uh, and important program uh, out here. I am lucky enough to be uh, extremely vetted before, before I get here. So I am a citizen, uh, but my heart goes out to those people who are uh, facing immigration problem. And, uh, and the first point, you know, one of, by, by the way, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful and inspiring story. Uh, but w one of the question is, you know, I have uh, some opinions and some questions. A lot of Americans don't know why people come to the United States in the first place. And uh, uh, nobody, of course, thought uh, that President Trump would be the president because he was so clear on what he's going to do. Absolutely clear. And he was not defended of what he said he's going to do. Just eight years ago, when uh, uh, then uh, Senator Obama, who became President Obama, agreed that he's going to legalize everybody in the United States. American people overwhelmingly voted him twice, not once, twice. Whatever happened, it didn't happen. And President Trump proposed absolutely opposite of what President Obama said, and people voted for him overwhel overwhelmingly. How did he win? Don't ask me that, but he's a president. Anyway, so many Americans don't know why immigrants get into this country and how. For example, I am an Oromo uh, uh, from Oromo land, current Ethiopia, where genocide is taking place. Many of you don't know this. It's the dictator government, the minority ethnic group with a small five million people ruling 100 million with helicopter-supported genocide, killing people. I lost family members and many Oromos, now refugee, Oromo refugees around the world. Everywhere in Kenya, in Middle East, women are being raped and killed. So my question is this. Look, I am an activist, a human rights activist. We have also a well-known activist whose name is Jawar Mohammed, who is verifying every important information from uh, Oromoland, Ethiopia, on his Facebook and on Oromo Media Network. His Facebook was locked a few days ago, but uh, thanks to Harvard community, and uh, somebody uh, spoke to Facebook headquarters, and they unlocked him. What he is reporting is a dead body from back home. The government is in the verge of falling. So for some reason, his Facebook was interrupted. He couldn't able to pass information, but that was unlocked. Now, the Romo Media Network Facebook account was under scrutiny. Excuse me, They're could, could you, we're so, running out of time. Could you cut to the question, please? What, my question is, how, how much does American people know why immigrants people come to this country? There are many reasons why people come to this country, but um, on a fundamental level, I think you are within the ballpark of plausibility to argue that there are many Americans who have a difficult time apprehending why people come to the country, what motivates them to come. 
And I would argue that there are a couple of interrelated reasons for this, although I would also push back against some of the socio-political framing of your question. But I, I mean, in the interest of not dragging uh, my response out, I'll simply focus on, on one issue. So much of the immigration discourse uh, nowadays, um, on, on both the left and the right, and I count myself as a liberal progressive who advocates from the left, um, has uh, been centered on the merits of immigrants um, and on adjudicating issues of merit. What has been minimized, I think, and what needs to be brought back to the fore is the degree to which U.S. interventions and, in fact, geopolitical shifts and configurations are responsible for driving immigrants to the United States in the first place and consequently create conditions of moral responsibility for those of us who are in the country. So to look at the case of Central America for a moment or to look at the case of the Hispanophone Caribbean, where I'm from, it's clear that the trajectory of U.S. geopolitical interventions in these areas permanently altered the political landscapes of these different countries, created the conditions of outflow uh, and immigrant exodus that have characterized the dynamics of migration to the United States for the past several decades. And so that comes with moral responsibilities, I think, that need to be appreciated, that need to be um, uh, the set to in the conversation uh, more emphatically. And yet they're minimized for a different reason. Um, and this is the reason on which I'll, I'll sort of end my response to you. We were talking a, a, a little bit before uh, the program started tonight about the kind of amnesia that sets in after one or two generations of the migrant experience um, for, for many Americans. So um, as Gita pointed out, if you're not Native American, then you, you, you are an immigrant in some way, shape, or form. And yet, it becomes exceedingly easy for um, families and communities in the United States to forget not just that they hailed from immigrants, but that they were created and their identities were shaped and molded by the trajectory of immigration. And that as a consequence, they, they should embrace the responsibilities that come with protecting new generations of immigrants. And how this becomes, this form of amnesia becomes integral uh, to the production of these nativist fantasies that have corralled and, uh, and, 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 and really serve to constrain uh, the possibilities of contemporary immigrant discourse is a long story that uh, many people have tried to work out in various books. But for now, I would say that this is one of the issues that has to be rectified if we are to arrive at a truly just and humane immigration policy. To recover for many, many Americans the memories, the dreams, the anxieties that characterize their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents' drive to come here and the desire to create a new life that left them as the inheritors uh, and descendants of that legacy. I'm not the, the smartest guy probably in the room. I I'm, I'm consider myself a street guy, and my daughters call me a corny old man. So I'm going to give them ammunition to call, continue to call me that. And it really, to me, it comes down to Emma. Lazarus's poem on the Statue of Liberty, and that is, uh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That is no different uh, today than it was when that statue went up. Well, um, on that note, um, I think that it's true to say that the INS has changed their message, I've heard recently. Is that not true? <laughs> they and it does no longer say this. What, what's it now say? It's, um... so they removed Nation of Immigrants. Uh, uh, the USCIS removed Nation yeah, of Immigrants. No more. Oh, no. Yeah. So, but an enforcement agency. Yeah. Uh, responsible right. for enforcing right. the laws. Mm -hmm. So I have, to, I have to close on, on a sort of a cryptic note, which is always when people... And when I think about coming to America, the first thing that happens at immigration is they say, welcome to America. When are you leaving is the second question. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly always the second question. Um, OK, I think it's been a marvelous, marvelous evening. I'm very grateful for these wonderful speakers that we've had. Mm -hmm.